I don't feel like it's going to be um, <clears throat> the stupidest decision I've ever made, but it's going to take a few days of walking around there just to sort of see what I'm up against and the kind of walking two or three days between villages and trying to find water. So I'm really relying on my guide. Um, and I'm also excited. I'm, this is what I wanted, some isolation. So I'm getting away, so I'm pushing myself and I feel like I'm crawling slowly out on a limb and even before I've hiked. As a child, I love stories of survival and adventure and have spent much of my life exploring the outdoors. On a 150 kilometre hike through the Grampians National Park in Australia, I became lost in a remote range. As night was nearing, I stumbled across an old Aboriginal rock shelter and sought refuge there. I was struck by the realisation this was once someone's home and the paths I'd been walking for leisure were once tracks for survival. For the rest of the hike, I imagined what it was like for the Aboriginals to live here. I became fascinated with the idea of exploring and experiencing a remote tribal area where walking long distances is still a part of daily life and survival. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. The idea would take me across three continents and would push me to my breaking point both physically and mentally as I battled with severe illness, struggled to find food and water and had to avoid a government that didn't want me there. Nere anyo barbado e kare he di to mo anyo luzo e duza. Nere anyo barbado e kare he di to mo anyo luzo e duza. Kuro cha kara te ugoloni ke nero giza kya ngati. He ra cha kara te ugoloni ke nero giza kya ngati. Six months later, my first stop is northern Italy to commence training in the soaring peaks of the Dolomite Mountains. Dissecting the cliffs are a series of via ferrate, or steel roads, that are traversed with a combination of hiking and climbing. For this expedition, I'm joined by my German friend and climbing partner, Christina, who will be helping me out with filming on the dangerous and precarious cliffs. The network of tracks, ladders and ledges are carved into sheer cliffs with drops of 400 metres. The Via Ferrate were constructed in the 18th century to access and connect village communities and farming pastures. At the outbreak of World War I, they were expanded by the Italian and Austrian armies who fought fierce battles in the Dolomites. The Via Ferrate were pounded by gunfire and the boots of tens of thousands of troops walking from battlefields and moving supplies. We managed to buy the worst type of muesli bar I've ever tasted. But unfortunately, you're not allowed to re leave rubbish at the hut, so we have to carry him, but the weight's too much, so let's try. Oh, it's terrible. Face it. Despite only being at 3,000 metres, late on the first day I become tight-chested and struggle to breathe. I suspect it's the effects of altitude, but when I start experiencing heart palpitations and a severe fever, I fear it is something much worse. Lebanon is my last stop on the way to Ethiopia. I have been chronically fatigued for eight weeks, sleeping up to 16 hours a day and suffering hot and cold sweats. However, I desperately need fitness and head to the mountains of the north. I've just started up El Sayed, which is the highest peak in Lebanon. Um, 
It's actually a ski field for the start, which is all uphill and even though I've only been walking a few hundred meters, um, my fitness is just absolutely terrible since getting uh, Lyme disease. Yesterday I spent in the Kadisha Valley, which is an extraordinary place. I spent a lot of time off track, partly checking out some climbing cliffs and the other part getting lost as usual and I um, got exhausted quickly. In the warmer months, farmers cross these barren mountains in search of grazing for their sheep and goats. Up here for weeks on end, they sleep on the hard ground in rock shelters to block the cold night winds. The two 10 kilometer hikes leave me exhausted. I'm only days away from flying to Ethiopia and am deeply concerned. I have no idea how I will handle the demands of long distance walking in such an extreme environment. I land in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia's central capital city. Located in the far south, the Omo Valley borders Kenya, Uganda and South Sudan. The closest access point to the valley is Jinka, 800 kilometres away. Despite the three-day journey being slow, backbreaking and cramped, I'm falling in love with this country. I'm mesmerised by the diverse landscape and the people walking through it. The town of Jinka with its bustling markets is the starting point of my hike and the last place for me to stock up on supplies. Oh no, just this. It's also where I learn that hiking solo across the Omo hasn't been done this way before and my inquiries are getting the attention of everyone in town and the local government grows suspicious of my motives. How much? Burr? Bullet. Bullet. Bullet for... I learn there are no trained guides for hiking in the Omo, and I'm recommended a mercy named Oli Tula. He grew up in the Omo Valley, but now lives in Jinka. He has no experience, so I'll be relying on his instincts and connections. He's very keen to join me as he wants to learn how to use a video camera, so I'll be teaching him along the way. The plan is to hike 500 kilometres through the heart of the Omo and stop at various mercy villages. I've absolutely no idea what I need the most out there and spend hours packing and repacking, trying to prioritise what combination of food, medication and luxuries like a novel or writing book I can fit in whilst leaving enough room for water. It has been the absolute craziest four or five days since I got to to Jinka and trying to organise this trek has just been this roller coaster ride um, of conflicting information, um, lots of things changing, and um, <clears throat> a lot of setbacks. Uh, it all started with people saying there's no way we are to trek in this area, and then other people said, make sure you, you get a guide, but it'll have to be a guide from that area because if you're going into Mercy Land, the RE guides won't go in there, they're too scared because they'll be killed because of tribal conflicts and I'm kind of thinking I'm going into this area and then people say no no you'll be fine they don't worry about tourists so just have someone from that area but then someone else said that uh, they view tourists they think they're business people coming in who are going to take their land and so um <clears throat> and I said to a woman I said oh well, how bad I could get it like it's not like they could sort of string me up in a tree and gut me and she just kind of looked off and thought for the longest time and then went so can you show me a map and that was it. So I'm like, my God, what am I doing going into this territory? And then went down to the tourist uh, office and they refused to give me a permit to go hiking in there, which is kind of strange because you don't need a permit. You just need to register. And, and two journalists only last week were locked up in the area because they were taking photos and asking too many questions. And I think that they thought I was a journalist. So 24 hours later, we managed to wrangle a permit to get into the park and then we're sort of set to go. So. Now it's the night before I leave and to be honest it's really mixed emotions, there's a nervous excitement and anticipation but at times I've 
been scared. You know, I'm going into an area that is a harsh landscape. Nobody speaks English. My guide doesn't even speak English. And um, food and water are limited in areas. And I'm thinking, why couldn't I just go on a normal trek? To reach the Omo Valley is a steep day and a half walk through rural villages inhabited by the Ari. The Ari use the rain-soaked land to farm fruit, vegetables, coffee and livestock. As their communities are connected through a series of foot tracks and muddy roads, they walk for hours every day to get to markets, work and school. Stop for lunch on the first day and do you ever get the feeling that you're being watched? This is um, the proximity and people that have sat or stood around me while I'm eating my lunch. More than, more than a trek, uh, more than a Ferengi, I feel like uh, I'm in a fishbowl. <laughs> when we start crossing a river, the man we met two hours ago and whose donkey is carrying our packs disappears down a different route. He has everything I own. I feel incredibly vulnerable. I just have to accept that every day I must put my trust in complete strangers. <laughs> We slog into Balema, the last town before the Omo Valley, and search for a place to stay for the night. Amen. Yeah. Ishi, Ishi, that's yes, the yeah. way. Yeah, that's how you know. Move up, that's the way. 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 Move up, that's the to descend into the valley, we must go through what is essentially no man's land. Due to current tribal conflicts, it's too dangerous for the Ari and the Mercy to enter each other's territories. The once well-trodden foot track, used as a trade route for food and cattle, is now overgrown. Bee tubes placed high in the trees is a sign we are nearing a Mercy village. Lo Omo Valley! To finally step onto the Omo is an exciting moment. My mind goes back to that night in the Aboriginal cave shelter. It seems so far away in both distance and time. We arrive in the village that Oli Tula grew up in. Whilst his sister-in-law and her children prepare us a meal, he's keen to show me around and introduce me. The children in particular are extremely curious as they rarely see foreigners and are not quite sure what to make of a video camera. No, that's a phone. <laughs> okay. 
This is um, mud. Yeah. So it's raised up so animals can't get to it. Ooh, that. Wow, there's a lot of food. Yes. Uh, tilly? Tiller. Tiller, sorry, tiller, yeah. Okay, so this is tiller, my traditional mercy food, my first time trying. Good. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, I don't know what it's like. Almost like stuffing or something. Yeah. It's, um, I like it. It's really good. As the Mercy start walking at first light without breakfast, I need to wake early to eat and pack. Usually I love the early morning piece before hiking, but my mind is caught up on what lies ahead. The most significant problem of our language barrier is Ollie Tula can't tell me how far we are walking each day. I have absolutely no idea whether I'll be walking six hours or 12. Worse still, I don't know when I will get water. Does the four litres I'm carrying have to last me five hours, or for today, tonight, and tomorrow? So we've been walking for about two and a half, three hours on the third day, and just met up with a husband and wife and their child who are walking in the same direction. They've been collecting water, and he's carrying about 20 kilograms on his head. So trekking here is more like a, uh, a commute. You don't um, stop and look at views, it's just solid walking. We've had one sort of three minute break. There are only about 10,000 Mercy spread across the Omo Valley. Living in small clans, they are semi-nomadic pastoralists and move around seasonally to where it is best for grazing cattle and growing crops. Individuals, small groups and families walk long distances between villages to get food, trade goods and for social gatherings. Even in the most isolated of places, in nondescript bushland, we come across signs of where the Mercy have been walking and living. This is incredible. We're weaving our way through the, the jungle. Uh, I don't know where my guide has gone, but a young Mercy woman and with a baby on her back and probably 10 or 15 kilograms on her head is actually leading the way and seeing a cracking pace. Um, but because of the weight on her head, she actually can't reach up to pick berries. So we're getting to various trees and we're stopping and she's asking me to, uh, to grab them for her. Eventually I find Oli Tula crossing the Magu River. The Magu is one of two major rivers that carve their way through the Omo. They are the lifeblood of the Mercy for drinking, planting seasonal riverbed crops, and watering their cattle. There's a lot of rocks and the current is really strong, making it difficult to cross. I've drunk less than two litres of water today, but the river is also used as a bath and a toilet by people and cattle. As dehydrated as I am, a stomach not accustomed to the water risks potentially fatal illnesses like cholera, dysentery, or hepatitis A. So I go without. We have been walking for seven hours without a break, but now that we have reached a life source, we stop to eat and rest. been uh, going for 10 hours now and we're just slowly slogging up this hill. Absolutely exhausted now. I'm trying to work out how much further to go. I can't wait to get into camp and I've got to get some water that I can drink.
That was scary. That was probably the biggest adventure that I've had on this trip so far. Um, we were uh, just coming up to the village that we're staying at for the night. We rounded a corner and two army soldiers, two police and a government official were standing there waiting for us. Essentially we've been denied access to the rest of the national park, which actually it's not all national park, some of it is free land. But I feel like we've kind of got to watch ourselves over the next, next few days because uh, two journalists were detained about a week and a half ago. Just collapsed into my tent, absolutely exhausted. Um, I think in the end we probably clocked about 30 kilometers of walking and it was pretty hot and humid for most of the day. Uh, I don't know, it's hard to kind of sum up, I'm not thinking very clearly. Um, dinner took a long time to cook, um, but so that was just one of the most incredible days of walking and it's a good example of I felt really out of my comfort zone two days ago and just kind of pushed on and had some experiences that just wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't have pushed on. Um, and having a rest day tomorrow, which is good and probably do some washing because I absolutely stink at the moment. Um, and I also think I might go and pick a fight. Uh, the more I think about it, uh, the angrier I am that we're being denied access to walk across public land. Um, and who knows what tomorrow will throw up, but Mercy is just the most incredible place to be in, so I um, can't wait to see what's happening next. Whilst I wait to see what is going to happen, a rest day is much welcomed and a chance to relax and socialise. <laughs> So the main two things I've been missing while I've been travelling is going and watching the rugby and is eating popcorn at the cinema. Now in Mercy there's no cinemas but I've actually found popcorn as the Mercy do it and it's not quite the same as what you get in Hoyts or Village but it's really good. <laughs> okay, we're just comparing cultural body fashions and this is a mercy look which is the ear plates and the scarring and this is my equivalent and the funny thing is is they look at that and they go oh, ow, and think that must hurt a lot um, when they actually use splinters to create this scarring Ouch. <laughs> that night I tracked down the officials and in the ensuing argument I realised why I was denied a non-existent permit in Jinka. They are worried I'm a journalist. I insist I'm only a tourist on a hike but they still refuse to let me walk further into the valley. Tempers flare and I'm told I either leave by foot or be taken out by the army. Refused entry into the Omo National Park, we are left with no choice but to take a different route. The village we need to reach by nightfall is 50 kilometres away. It's about 8 o'clock in the morning and it is absolutely scorching already. The temperature is into the 30s already and 
It's a beautiful area, but it's an open savanna that we're uh, trekking through. So there's no protection from the sun and there's no clouds in the sky. So it's only going to get hotter and hotter. After four hours of walking, it is clear we're in trouble. We are less than halfway, tired, and down to two litres of water between the three of us. The seriousness of the situation drives home the reality that for many in the world, the distance you walk daily is determined by how far it is to the next point of survival. An hour later, we get a little bit of luck and stumble across a small group of Mercy grazing cattle. Even better, one actually speaks English. <laughs> Is this for, uh, for the other city. animal or other for people? The, people? For the animal, for the hyena, for the tiger, for the... There's tigers here? Yeah, no, what? in the grass here. Oh, really? and hyenas? <laughs> yeah, well, in, a in a light, in a light. Maybe I should carry, no. carry <laughs> this in case of life. <laughs> yeah, maybe you should be using it. You know people calling a body. Yeah, yeah. Fighting it together. The body? The body. Oh, OK, are. so yeah. sometimes... Sometimes we fight with, with, with... You know people calling a nangatom? Nangatom, yeah? Yeah, we're fighting each other together. You fight? Yeah, we... You fight, fight the nangatom? Yeah. OK. We fight the nangatom by gun. There's none here, though? Are there? Not There's in no, here. No, so Not I have to look out for... <laughs> <laughs> Nangatam with gun, hyena, hyena, and we tiger. Did you say tiger? Tiger and lion. The most dangerous thing is here is the mosquitoes. Yeah, there's malaria. That kills. In here. No mosquito in here. There's no malaria. Yeah, but down a little Normally bit in in, uh, in Maki. In Maki, sometime. More pe Yeah, that's the most yeah, dangerous sometime. thing. Yeah. yeah. yeah they said there's something like what, every month a hundred malaria cases. Yeah. Mursi, what are we needed to eat yeah. watching a uh, hand like this? Tila, 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 Time for tila. Time yeah. for tila. I try to pay for the food and water they have given us, but they refuse, and no matter how much I insist, I am told, as I am walking with the mercy, I will be treated as a mercy. The one disadvantage of meeting an English speaker is he can tell me how far we have to go. Despite being buoyed by some food and water, as we set off again, we know that our destination is still 32 kilometres away. It's uh, middle of the afternoon, maybe 3.30. So I've been walking since um, quarter past seven this morning and the clouds came in for a while and they've cleared again. It's been like this for probably the last two and a half hours. And the sun is just absolutely ferocious. Just absolutely beating down on us here. And on this track, there's no trees. Overhangs not getting any shade. And these guys are set of ducking off to the side whenever they can get some shade. Really sweating and I'm really feeling I've still got water left, but you know, if we've got another, I don't know, three hours of this. <sighs> this is some of the hottest weather I've been in, some of the hardest work I've had to do outdoors. Journalist, I'm like the most vulnerable, and Ollie Tool has got a camera in my face. <laughs> 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 oh, I was just trying to get five minutes sleep. Far out. <laughs> you, you ten bur, ten bur. <laughs>
It's late in the day, uh, but the sun has now dropped uh, at an angle that we're now getting some shade from trees. And about five minutes ago, I got three big stings from tetsy flies, which is normally a worry because they carry a uh, sleeping disease. But I was actually happy because they only hang out near rivers. So that means we're near to a water source and possibly we were camping tonight. So, which is good because it's very close to breaking point. Uh, I was just exhausted. He was really knocking me around, so live to fight another day. Woo! It has taken us 13 hours to walk to 50 kilometres and due to rationing, I've only drunk three litres of water despite the temperatures soaring to 39 degrees. I find a well with drinking water, then Olitor and I collapse on the hard ground and sleep for hours until we are woken by children prodding us. As we set off on our final day, Ollie Tuller and I are exhausted and sore, but now we face a steep climb all the way up out of the Omo Valley. However, knowing it's only four hours, it doesn't seem too demanding, and I know we've got enough in us to make it. We become disorientated in thick scrub and bash around for an hour trying to find a path. I feel like I've spent so much of my time trying to find my way in the outdoors. It entertains me that Oli Tula, a mercy in his own lands, can get lost. No, man. The feeling quickly wears off though when I realise I'm lost with him. Because it rained yesterday, it's an absolute quagmire here, so your feet really quickly get caked in mud and it feels like it's about a kilogram on each foot extra. It takes us five hours to reach the top of the valley and we plan on hitching a ride. We can't believe it though when we get to a village and they tell us heavy rains have made some roads impassable and there are no trucks today. So we have to keep walking. Farangi is fine. Farangi is fine. Is fine? Yeah. Okay. Uh. <laughs> well, it's another either two hours or six hours from our destination. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, right. Okay. Got mud in my eye and We've been going for, I think, nearly eight hours and nearly had enough of today, but now we've come across, we've got ourselves some bananas that are red. I've never seen red banana, let alone eaten one, but I'm that hungry and exhausted um, and just a bit over it. We're at this point, but I'm gonna eat it, so if it's toxic or something like that. It's nice knowing you. 
kind of looks alright there. Mm. Tastes like an old banana. Yeah. Oh, should get me through. I'm up, I said. <laughs> Today has been one unrelenting hill after the next, and these muddy tracks make it feel like we are hiking in quicksand. I'm exhausted, but I wouldn't change this for anything. I know this is about to end, and when it does, I'm going to miss the places I've seen along the way, the warm and generous people I've met, and the daily foot commute that is life in this part of the world. This is the government provided local shoe and foot wash after slogging up the um, mud hills and we're absolutely caked in it. It's amazing how persistent this hill has been and slippering up and down, slipping and sliding in the mud has made it that fair bit harder. But 10 minutes ago I knew had a, had a guffle. I was ready to, uh, I don't know, not throw it in, but maybe just have a bit of a tantrum. But I think just up here looks like the end of the walk. Oh, same with any walk, you have those moments when you're just exhausted and had enough and then you get to the end and it's just, it's absolutely worth it. It was incredible. So I'm looking forward to a beer now, so that is my goal to try and find a beer. Is it beer? Okay. He's good. It's nice. Something just bit me. I hope that wasn't a scorpion. <laughs> 